invite me back. Um, this is, I think, my th this is my third visit here with you all, so it's kind of become my annual pilgrimage. And um, so we're going to talk about um, carbon acetate, but um, I, I, there's some other imaging I think we're going to talk about as well, MRI and some bone scans, kind of set the stage for imaging in general with prostate cancer. Um, because there's a lot of new advanced imaging. Carbon acetate is going to be mostly what I'm going to focus on, um, but it's, I think, important to understand some of the other um, imaging, age, imaging procedures that are, are being done and where they fit in you know, for prostate cancer. So, um, quite a few different techniques. This is actually two slides. These are, these are the imaging techniques that are typically used now or being have been used for prostate cancer. Um, CT scanning and technetium bone scanning is something that almost everybody gets uh, as part of their workup for initially for their prostate cancer and even for um, detecting recurrences. And they're not very good studies. Um, the anatomic definition when we get those studies is just not adequate for prostate cancer, so we often miss things. Um, and it's one reason that a lot of urologists don't even like to do those scans before uh, doing surgery or doing radiation because they're not very effective. Um, MRI, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's very good at looking at the prostate gland itself, the, the anatomy of it. We'll talk a little bit about a, uh, the multiparametric MRI, which is, um, has some additional features with it. Um, technetium bone scans uh, is something we do a lot of. And I'm going to just talk about why I don't like to do those anymore. I'm really in favor of doing sodium fluoride bone scans. Um, there's an old scan called Prostacent. Has anyone had a Prostacent scan? Okay. So not recently, I hope. No. Yeah. So this, it's a scan that we uh, we hope would work, but it, it's just detection rate and sensitivity um, very low. And we're we're now looking at kind of the next generation of uh, PSMA agents, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so, kind of going back to processing, but in a, in a different way. Um, and um, there's uh, carbon acetate, which has been mentioned. We're going to talk in detail about that. There's also a very similar agent, which is carbon choline, uh, primarily done at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester and a few other uh, sites. Um, gallium PSMA and about a few other PSMA agents, um, and even some other molecular agents. So, what's happened over the last few years, since even the first time I came, and spoke here. There's a lot of momentum in trying to do better as far as imaging prostate cancer. So a lot of work being done. Okay, so MRI, um, as I mentioned, very, very good at looking at the prostate itself. Um, this is an image of looking at a cross section of the prostate. We're, this is the front of the pelvis. This is the rectum here. Um, this is the prostate gland. This is the, this is the same gland. We're looking at it from front to back. Kind of looks like a little heart shape here. So this is the bottom, this is the top. And here, we're, I don't know if you can see that the, it's kind of folded a little bit, but we're looking at it from side to side. So the prostate gland is here, this is the bladder, and this is the rectum. What, what, what MRI gives us, uh, which really no other study, not ultrasound, not PET, nothing else, it actually lets us look at the internal anatomy of the gland. So this whole area here is the gland. But this is a transitional zone. We see some of the central portion of the gland. And this area out here is called the peripheral zone. And um, with MRI, we're able to see things like in this case, um, this is the right side of the gland. There's see this little dark shadow or dark, dark area here within that peripheral zone. That's prostate cancer. So we can measure it for size. We can, we'll look at it um, compared to the rest of the gland. And, and about 70 to 80 percent of prostate cancers happen in this outer or peripheral zone. So uh, MRI very good at looking at that. Um, you can see that same area when we're looking at it from front to back and also from side to side. Um, so this is a, a generally good technique. We use uh, the T2 sequence. We have a couple different sequences that we run the magnet. Um, depending on, on how we pulse that magnet, it allows us to see water molecules in different ways. Some, uh, some pulses will let us see bone, fat, blood, and, uh, and vasculature different between the T1 and the T2. So T2 sequence is preferred for uh, the prostate. Um, and uh, this is another image showing also prostate. Uh, large central portion here, very glandular tissue. Here's the peripheral zone. And this 
left side of the peripheral zone here basically has an area in it that has a little bit lower density or little lower signal than the rest, so it's suspicious. So one of the things with, even with MRI is when the lesion is about a centimeter or greater than a centimeter, the T2 sequence is, is usually pretty good at picking things up. Um, when it's smaller than that, even the MRI starts having difficulty because you're still looking at, you're looking at shades of gray. So, I mean, you, you have to spend a lot of time learning to look at these to really pick out the nuances. So, one of the things that's done now is adding additional sequences or multiple parameters. And these parameters have to really do with looking at um, really two aspects, um, blood flow in, in the gland, um, and we do that by following contrast. So we inject a contrast in, we follow how that contrast transits through the gland, and areas that have increased blood vessels or increased vasculature, the contrast is going to go in quicker and it's going to come out quicker. And that sequence is called the Dynamic Contrast Enhancement Sequence, or a D DCE. And, um, and we can then translate the, that flow of blood, uh, or the flow of the contrast, into a color map. So in this particular case here, we're translating that color map or the, the, the dynamic contrast enhancement, you can see that that really becomes much easier to look at. And so we can pick up smaller things and it helps complement our visual inspection of the T2 sequence. Um, another sequence we have is what's called diffusion weighted image. And um, what that is looking at is kind of how the squeeze of the cells are. Um, it's really looking at the, the free movement of water molecules between the cells and when there's cancer, the cells get a little bit more compact and the ability of water to diffuse between the cells diminishes. And so what we, what we see as a result is what we call restricted diffusion, so a drop in, in that diffusion. And we can also display it as a color map so we can see where there's basically this, the water molecules are just not able to move as freely as the rest of the gland and, and bring that out. Those are the, the T2 sequence, the DCE, and, and the DWI, or dynamic um, uh, diffusion weighted images. Those are the main uh, parameters that we look at with multiparametric MRI. Um, some people also will do spectroscopy. Um, I think that's really kind of fallen out of favor. We don't see that done very often. But this is looking at metabolites, and you can see it's kind of done in a grid, and it allows us to look at the ratio of choline to citrate. Um, and the MRI is capable of doing that. And we see that ratio change in areas of prostate cancer. Um, a little bit less precise just because we can only evaluate areas that are within these what we call voxels. So something that's very small, it might cross over a couple of uh, voxels we might miss. But it's a very, very good technique at looking at the gland itself. And, um, is, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier. It's, it's a, a technique that's really poised to give us better direction for following um, low-rate prostate cancer, so as far as active surveillance, we can look at all these parameters and we can tell if something's changing in size or changing in vascularity, which are indicators that it might be more aggressive, and also give us more appropriate targets to biopsy. Um, and using MRI-guided biopsy, whether that's fused with ultrasound or doing it in the MRI unit, we get the needle right into that area rather than doing random biopsies. Okay. So um, next I'm going to talk a little bit about sodium fluoride, uh, PET scanning. So, and we'll just talk about PET scanning in general first. So PET scanning is a technique um, that we combine a CT scan and we combine a molecular um, imaging agent. Um, it's really two scans that are combined together. Um, patients go through the CT scanner and then they go through, um, essentially it's a glorified Geiger counter. Uh, it picks up radiation that we, um, uh, the radiation hits a crystal, lights up, and we translate that crystal lighting up into a digital signal. It's three-dimensional. When we combine it with the CT scan, we have very precise information as to where that came from. So we're combining anatomy and metabolism. Um, a sodium fluoride bone scan is a PET scan. An FDG PET scan where we use uh, fluorinated sugar is a PET scan. Carbon acetate, carbon choline, they're all PET scans. Um, it's what the agent that we inject that we're following that's giving off the radiation is the different part of it, but the, the machinery, the technique itself is all the same. Okay, so um, techniques in bone scans, 
This is an example of one here. Uh, it's what we call planar imaging or two-dimensional imaging. We inject a, a tracer in that goes to the bone that acts like calcium. And we uh, put people on the camera and we have, because the, the, basically the detector goes uh, over the front and the back and a few angles. Um, how many people have had a technetium ball scan? Wow, not that many. Surprise. Um, so this is really still the mainstay for looking for bone metastases with prostate cancer. Uh, the problem with it is it's two-dimensional. Um, we're dealing with people in general who have maybe a little wear and tear on their bones, a little arthritis, a little degenerative changes, a little bit of life on their bones. And uh, we often end up with these kind of findings where there's a little focus somewhere in the spine, it's usually in the back part of the spine. And when we read these scans, the interpretation is usually it's probably degenerative, but I can't rule out metastatic disease. Um, and so they can be very uh, unhelpful. Also, the lesions on, on, uh, in the bone have to be about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half for us to see them on here. And uh, usually PSA has to be quite high, or at least over 10. That's kind of the, the normal metrics. So here's an example of a gentleman. His PSA is 0 0.84. He had the technetium bone scan. There was this little spot here. And this was read out as probably degenerative disease. Okay. He had a, this is a sodium fluoride bone scan. It also uses an agent. Sodium fluoride acts also like calcium. The difference is it goes into the bone at a much higher rate. And since it's a PET scan, we get a three-dimensional image combined with a CT scan. So we have very, very discrete anatomic localization of where these things are. So that spot, this is the spot here that you can see here. You see it's much brighter, it's much bigger on this scan, so we can see it uh, in a way we could not see it here. And when we match it to the CT scan, I can see exactly where that is within the bone. So this is actually in the bone marrow, it's not part of the joint, that's a metastasis, it's not degenerative disease. Um, the difference between these two scans really is the precision. Here we're going to waffle, we're going to equivocate, here we're going to say, I know where exactly this is, and I can say it's either one or the other, and not um, uh, and not be guessing. In this patient also, with this scan, it also shows a small lesion uh, a little further down in, in the spine that we couldn't see at all on this, so there's actually two lesions. So this is also done from head to toe, so I look, we look through the entire bone and we get a very good assessment. Um, so just it's a superior technique by far, and um, for, for patients with prostate cancer, this is the bone scan of choice. Uh, techniques in bone scan is just generally not something I would recommend. So here's another example. Uh, this is the front view of a technetium bone scan. There was this little area here in the uh, lumbar number three, um, and uh, this was thought to be a possible metastasis, but it was left at that. Um, you can't really see it from the back. And now here's that same patient. Um, this is lumbar number three. We can see that's within the bone marrow of the body of the bone. It's not anywhere near the, the uh, joints. Very, very definitive, that's a bone metastasis. But when we look to the rest of this, there's another metastasis a little higher up in the ninth vertebra. There's a small area in uh, this side of the pelvis, the right side of the pelvis. A really tiny one here on the bottom part of the other side of the pelvis. And there's also some in the ribs and there was also some in the skull. So this changed from possible one metastasis in the bone to multiple metastases in, in, in uh, uh, different areas. So treatment plan, very different. Potentially go after one bone metastasis versus we need to be more aggressive because we have much more than we thought we had. Okay, so carbon acetate. Um, Right now, we're at a position where we've, we've done quite a lot of these um, over, over three different protocols for different stages of prostate cancer. We're now at about, I think, 950 studies that uh, we completed, I think, uh, as of yesterday. Um, close to 600 or over 600 of those patients have been patients specifically with recurrent disease. So they've had prostate, uh, prostatectomy, radiation, or both, and, and we're seeing a rising PSA that we're trying to investigate. Um, we've seen very good success with that. I'm going to share a little bit of the data of where we are and, um, and some of the parameters that we've been able to come up with as far as uh, selection. So I'm going to show you some examples of that. So again, this is a PET scan um, with carbon acetate. It lets me look at the soft tissue, so I can look at the prostate or prostate bed. I can look at the lymph nodes, 
the liver, the lungs, and also the bones. So it's just much more comprehensive. Um, so in this gentleman here, we're looking at the pelvis. This is the front side, this is the back, this is right and left. These are the bones. This is the prostate gland here. And this gentleman had had external beam radiation um, previously. His PSA had uh, dropped from 6.8 to 0.4, a little over 0.4, uh, four years before this. But now it's rising, so PSA was 3.9. The doubling time, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail later, but his doubling time was quite slow. This was moving in about two years doubling time. So in the gland here, there's this area that you can see on the right side that's lighting up. Um, and we're looking at it from side to side here. We're looking at it from front to back. And it's, there's just a very discrete focus in the gland. So what's important with this also then is we can look elsewhere throughout. So I can look through all of the rest of the pelvis looking for lymph nodes. Um, looking throughout the bone, looking through the lungs, and making sure that this is the only thing we saw. So um, we didn't see any other lesions, so, nothing, so it was really just confined, or what we call a local recurrence. And uh, this was biopsy to prove that we were indeed correct. And, uh, and this gentleman, I believe, underwent brachytherapy, so he had salvage um, brachytherapy, so seeds were placed in there. And um, I can't see what his follow-up PSA was from, the, from here, but it most definitely dropped. So it helped really focus the, the treatment with a uh, high level of confidence. So here's another example. This is a gentleman who had had a prostatectomy uh, 11 years previously. Um, his uh, PSA had gotten down to undetectable, essentially. And when we did the study, the PSA 3.3 with a doubling time of close to 11 months. Uh, so this is the prostate bed. Um, what we expect to see in the prostate bed is no activity at all. So anything lighting up in the prostate bed is a problem. Uh, this is a clip from the surgery. There's just clearly a small focus here uh, within the, uh, the prostate bed. Um, so, uh, and then again, no lymph nodes, nothing in the bone, nothing in the lungs, so everything else clean. Um, and this gentleman went on to have salvage radiation to the bed and uh, PSA uh, was falling and has just continued to fall throughout his follow-up. Okay, so another example after uh, prostatectomy, uh, again the pelvis from the front and the back. This is the bladder here, the urinary bladder, here's the rectum. This is a, a seminal vesicle on the right and a seminal vesicle on the left. There's usually after surgery a little bit of the seminal vesicle or a remnant of the seminal vesicle is often left behind. Um, some of the surgeons can't see, it's just kind of the, the, the tail end of it. Um, there's clearly a focus of metabolism in the right seminal vesicle. Um, that we couldn't pick up with anything else. And um, this gentleman also underwent salvage radiation therapy. Um, and the difference with this is when we see something like this, the radiation oncologist takes it for information and changes the radiation plan dramatically. They focus on what we looked at acetate, so that goes along with it. One of the other things we like to do with this when we look at a rock curve analysis is we want to figure out what's the lowest point of PSA that this is a, a very good test. And usually what we, we pick is 85 to 87 percent, maybe up to 90 percent as a, as a question point. And then we design the statistics around it to see um, what the PSA is to, to meet that. And it turns out that our threshold PSA is 0.98, which is actually quite low. So what that tells us is, and which kind of mirrors when we looked at the PSA over 1, that this went up to 92 percent. <coughs> We're just kind of pushing that down a little bit further and saying, well, um, if once your PSA is at 0 0.98, this test has an 87% uh, accuracy of being able to pick out you know, the prostate cancer with good sensitivity and good specificity. Um, we didn't find the PSA velocity to have any influence. Um, and as we talked about before, the, the doubling time did have an influence, but we found that it had an influence only when the PSA was less than 1. So once the PSA is greater than one, doubling time didn't matter. Um, we did also the, uh, kind of a, uh, the same kind of rock curve analysis to see if we're going for an 88% sensitivity with the doubling time, what was that sweet spot for the doubling time? And it, it came out to 3.8 months. So again, really following in when we, when I, when we arbitrarily looked at our data at 3, 3 to 10, greater than 10 months, um, this gives us just even a more specific metric, right around four months is is where I'd, I'd like to see it less than four months if we're going to get an optimal test. <coughs> okay. Uh, I think that's a repeat.
of a lot of what we're looking at. I think the, what this is adding here is a high detection rate of locally recurrent and intrapelvic disease, about 58%. So this is really guiding um, us to other focal therapy. One of the things that's important with acetate that we found is the performance when we compare our statistics, our larger numbers that we've done um, and published compared to, for example, with what they're doing at Mayo Clinic with, with choline, acetate outperforms choline significantly at the low PSA levels. Um, when, um, yeah, I think in Mayo, they prefer not to do a choline study until the PSA is at least over 1.5, even uh, uh, two, they like that better. They usually do not do a choline study with a PSA of less than one. Um, and uh, we've got about a 30 to 40 percent uh, difference in detection rate at that rate. Once we get over one to two, choline acetate performance really start to equalize. They're both very good um, once we get over those ranges. Okay, so next generation. Um, carbon acetate, we do them, we're doing a lot of them, we're doing them all day, but it's not locally available, right? So how many people have had a carbon acetate study? So you have to travel to Arizona to get it. Uh, or you have to go to Kansas University, or you have to go to Mayo Clinic for choline. Um, the rationale for that, the reason for that is it's labeled with carbon. It has a very short half-life of 20 minutes. It's the optimal tag for acetate and choline, so it works very well, but it can't be transported. It disappears too quickly. We can't make enough of it to basically put it in an ammo box and ship it across the country. So the, although it works extremely well, it, it's a somewhat of a logistic nightmare. Um, and it is very difficult to reproduce. So what we do in our site, we have a lot of manpower, we have a lot of uh, dedicated people to do it. That's very hard to replicate in enough places to do it consistently. So there is very much a search for a, an agent that works as well gives us these uh, ability to detect prostate cancer with very low PSAs, accurately stage the pelvis, and um, with fluorine or gallium as our tags, so which have longer half-lives, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, are more generally distributed, mostly the fluorine agents. Gallium is, is just starting. Um, so I'm gonna kind of roll back to prostacin here. Um, what we're targeting with these newer agents, what we're looking at targeting is something called the PSNA, which is a prostate-specific membrane antigen. Uh, it's somewhat misnamed because it's not specific to prostate, but it's mostly prostate. Um, it's actually also seen in a lot of vascular tumors. But um, this line here, this is the cell membrane, and so prostacin, which was labeled with indium, was an antibody. This is what an antibody looks like, and it was, it was targeted towards the intracellular part of the PSMA molecule. So this small, this antibody had to get into the, to the cell membrane and then attach, which meant it had, in order for it to do that, it had to circulate for a long time. And um, we tagged it with a, uh, an agent called indium, which is not a really good um, agent for imaging. It requires long imaging and the images are kind of fuzzy. So it was kind of our first attempt at tagging or targeting this uh, PSMA uh, target here and uh, not very successful, but we were doing that 20 years ago and I did quite a lot of them um, when it was the only thing we had. The next generation of agents are targeting the outer portion of this PSMA, which means they can get to them much quicker. We inject these agents, the circulating time can be much shorter. Um, they're tagged with fluorine or copper or zirconium. Fluorine in particular, it's a PET agent. We can use PET imaging. We get very small uh, anatomic detail, um, so it has a lot of promise. Um, there are probably at least two dozen PSMA targeting agents right now being developed. Um, some are much further along than others, some are just very early phases. I'm really all looking at trying to improve on this. Um, and you're going to hear, I think, about it um, in, in people who are having recurrences. You're going to hear about different protocols opening up at U UCLA, UCSF, uh, MD Anderson, all looking at their own PSMA uh, molecule. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing, um, which is great, but it also means there's not a concentrated effort on one or two potential winners. So um, we're going to see, I think, uh, this development take a little bit longer than we'd like. Um, here's some example images from those agents. And uh, so this is a gallium um, uh, HPED, which is a PSMA agent. This is an, an iodine version. 
Um, and this is um, F-18 DC FBCs. This is one that I think that was coming out of John Hopkins. Um, so uh, you get salivary glands, you get the liver, the spleen, a lot of kidney uptake, a lot of bladder, a lot of urinary bladder. But here you can see all these little these areas here. Those are all areas of prostate cancer. Uh, in this case here, this is a kidney, this is a kidney, and there's an area of prostate cancer in the bone here. Um, this with the F18 DC, DC FBC, uh, these spots here are the prostate cancer, but again, there's a lot of activity in the bladder, and there's a lot of activity in the blood pool. So you see these, this line going down here, that's the aorta, the, that's the main artery in the abdomen, and it splits into the arteries that go down in the legs. So, these agents are quite good at finding the prostate cancers, but we're gonna have a bit of a problem in the pelvis because if we're trying to find a local recurrence, for example, around where the prostate is, which is right around here, right around here, right around here, we're gonna be obscured by the bladder. So these agents have a lot of promise, but I suspect we're gonna be limited in the, the pelvis. If you go back to my earlier slide where we got a quarter of the people, we find something in that spot. So that means in a quarter of patients, we're going to completely mess. Um, so there's more work that has to be done on this. Optimally, we'd like an agent that does what these do, but doesn't go out to the urine. Um, I don't know that that's going to happen. Just the, the physiology of fluorine is it's a, it's a urinary excreted agent. Um, the same thing with gallium. Um, so you can just see the background is very different on those. Okay, so that was my last slide. And Frida. Answer any questions you might have. If you have a question, please put up your hand. We'll get you on the microphone. And uh, it's ten dollars a question. <laughs> it's, it's ten dollars for me, right? <laughs> uh, my ten dollar question is: uh, you talked about after you uh, have the image, you spot it you do some kind of salvage therapy. Can you uh, give a little more detail on, sure. on the, what, what is salvage therapy? Um, it's, it's evolving uh, pretty quickly. So I would say when we, when we um, radiation therapy in generally has been the choice for salvage therapy of going after lymph nodes. Um, in particular, or even going after an area within the gland. Um, if, it's, if it's only isolated to the gland, let's we'll start the gland and work our way up. If it's only isolated to the glands nowhere else, there's a, a number of choices. You could freeze it, you can burn it, you can um, uh, remove it if you'd like. But the main choices are breaking therapy seeds, so we do additional radiation. Um, there's HIFU, which now is approved in the United States, which that happened, I think, in October, which is new. So that's ultrasound, high-frequency ultrasound, heats it up. Uh, we can freeze it, so stick a, a probe into it and create an ice ball, and uh, that's called cryotherapy. Um, those are all things that we do as uh, for local recurrence, usually in an attacked prostate gland. But if there's something in the seminal vesicle on either side, those techniques can, can work, usually cryotherapy, it's a little easier to do. Um, what's happened, I think, more recently is we are seeing um, those that are doing SBRT, which is stereotactic body radiation, um, willing to go after things within the bed with radiation, even if it's been radiated, guided by this kind of imaging. So either MRI showing something or, or carbon acetate showing a discrete focus, they're willing to go in. This is CyberKnife, is a style of SBRT. Um, but usually what it means is five fractions of radiation, so short fractions of radiation is given over two weeks. Um, very, very focused. Um, we've got a couple protocols open uh, going on in the United States that they're looking at and it's doing very well. So as I said, it's kind of a moving target of what, what the right thing to do is. Um, as far as lymph nodes, um, IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy, is usually the choice because it, it gives them uh, the ability to treat the whole pelvic lymph nodes, and also do some spot radiation, um, and that's been quite effective. I have some colleagues who are doing SBRT, so short fractions, to just the nodes that we see. So one of the challenges with this is really trying to figure out what is the right technique to make sure we take care of the problem. And um, it's still a little bit all over the map. So radiating the whole pelvis makes a lot of sense, but it has to be done safely. 
um, and you want to make sure you don't leave anything behind, because then it gets to be a problem. Um, doing SBRT, I think, uh, so just focal radiation to a few nodes and leaving the rest of the pelvis. We've seen lots of successes with it, and I've also seen lots of failures with it. So six months, 12 months down the line, PSA starts coming back up, and we go back and look, and there's a lymph node right above where they treated. So it's in the next echelon. Um, so we need to refine those techniques. Um, surgery has become an option, where I think more so than it was even just a couple years ago, doing uh, lymphadenectomy, removing the lymph nodes in the pelvis, um, and there's at least one protocol where they're removing the lymph nodes from the pelvis and all the way up through the retroperitoneum, uh, even if there's only things in the pelvis. So they're cleaning out the lymph nodes. Um, and that's all being done now robotically, uh, because you wouldn't consider doing a procedure like that without robotics, because it's a big procedure. I know most people aren't going to be interested in it. With robotics, it's a, it's a three hour simple procedure, one night hospital stay, people are back on their feet in a day. Um, so, so, <coughs> um, it depends on who you ask. I would say everybody, uh, the radiation oncologists, am I on tape here? I don't know if I should say this. Okay, everyone ignore this. Radiation oncologists that I've talked to say surgery is a bad idea because you get lymphedema, you get swelling in the legs. The surgeons I've talked to, they say radiation is a bad idea because you get lymphedema or you get swelling in the legs. I have never seen lymphedema after pelvic nodal radiation. In, in, in someone who has had extensive surgery and a lot of things, you know, we've changed the lymphatic flow, and or who didn't already have a lot of nodal involvement. So the risk, I think, for, for swelling in the legs is if all the nodes are involved with cancer, you don't have lymph flow. There's no more for that lymphatic to, the lymph flow to go. It's already taken over by the cancer. Whether you radiate that, whether you remove them, it's, it's not going to change that. If you, were, if you were already set up for that leg swelling, that was already there. We see a lot of that with bladder cancers because they, they tend to involve the groin nodes a little bit lower down and they cause blockage. Um, and it's the cancer, it's not the, it's not the procedure. What I can say, at least with the patients that I've seen go through this, what we call extended retroperitoneal lymphadenectomy, everybody has done very well. I've not seen any complications. Um, but it's early. They haven't been doing them for very long, few numbers. And so that's something that I think we're going to keep tracking and, and see how people do. But it, but it opens up an option where a year ago if somebody said, well, I found three lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum. There's nothing anywhere else. Um, I, there's certain radiation oncologists that are very keen and very good at going after that, but most radiation oncologists won't do it. And so if you're connected with a radiation oncologist who says, uh-uh, nothing above the pelvis, I'm not going to radiate it, they give you your hormone therapy is your only choice. And so potentially hormone therapy for a very small amount of disease, that's just in a tough spot. So the, the lymphadenectomy, I think, opens up an opportunity to go in and clean it out and see what the PSA does. If we knock it down, great. If radiation is then indicated afterwards, we're, we're using it to clean it up, not using it to treat uh, a large nodal mass. So I think it can be much more effective. Um, if it's in the bone, depending on how many are in the bone. Radiation therapy still is something we're seeing people do. Um, going after what we call oligometastatic disease, so less than five. And that's usually, the, whether it's in the bone or outside of the bone, um, that number can be used, but I think it's more appropriate when we talk about bone lesions, if it's less than five. I think the radiation oncologists are willing to go after them with focal radiation, but it's also gonna be done in conjunction with hormone therapy, because we know the likelihood of, of a small lesion in the bone that we cannot see being there is pretty high, at least 50%. Yeah, that was a $10 question with a $100 answer. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, here we go. Hi, um, Just a couple of questions. One is, you mentioned that, um, and I went through your uh, treatment or your scans, uh, was uh, to inject and then scan on the, on the C11. Uh, and because you only have 20 minutes, I don't remember how long that scan took, but have you ever uh, actually injected twice? In other words, you inject them, you put them on the table, you scan, but maybe just to, uh, maybe there's some, even in that 20 minutes, there's a uh, uh, half-life de de degeneration. Uh, is it, 
Is it something that you could do? Is it, or is it something? Um, it, 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 it's a good idea. I think logistically it's tough to do. Part of it with, with an agent that has a short half-life, um, we have a challenge on how you manufacture it. So um, uh, carbon is made, and so the fluorine, all these other agents are made with a cyclotron. Um, it's essentially a, um, a beam that, or an electron that we, we uh, put into a magnet and we speed it up. Uh, and it goes out in circumference, that's why it's called a cyclotron, it goes in a circle, and as it, as it goes out, that speeds up, and we aim that at a target, whether it's uh, a solid material or a gas, we create the carbon um, for this on site. Um, because it decays, 20 minutes, you reach a threshold where, no matter how long you keep that beam on your target, you cannot, you cannot go past a certain level you can't accumulate this stuff and make, just keep making more and more and more. It reaches a plateau. So we have a, a physical limitation of how much material we can make on a run, and we have to move quickly. So, so part of that would be, we generally don't have enough material to say, let's do multiple injections. The other aspect to this is we are dealing with radiation, and when we do a dose, we want to stay within a certain parameter that we think is safe, essentially negligible, and once we start doing more injections, what we really have to do to make that safe is I'd have to reduce each injection to a lower millicarry amount, a lower radiation, because we don't want to blast you. So there's just some logistics and, and parameters on there that prevent us from being able to do that. But the other aspect of this is we start the imaging here. So we make sure that the pelvis and the abdomen are really in the sweet spot for the imaging. And because that is going to be our 60%, we want to make sure that that is going to always be in the right place. On the rare instance that we have an issue, so we start the imaging, we get halfway through, camera stops, we have a malfunction. We would reject. So if we had a time delay, we start over. We want to make sure that we're, we're doing it really confined to that protocol correctly. Okay, the other uh, question was really uh, asking your opinion, and that is, uh, uh, I have advised people that uh, have been just diagnosed to actually uh, have a scan, like uh, C11, uh, because it, it, to find out whether it's just confined to the prostate bed or, or prostate, or it may be somewhere else as well, and that would be a whole different course of treatment, uh, rather yes. than just treating the prostate, which most, myself included, had done without any other scans like yours to determine whether well, they already get out. And so I'm wondering what, you, what your opinion is on that. I think there are circumstances where that's appropriate. Um, I would say that there's, there's a role for multiparametric MRI in there first. So um, if we, and, and part of it is guiding it based on the Gleason score and the PSA. So um, uh, Gleason score seven or higher, a PSA of 10 or higher, doing a multiparametric MRI to look at the capsule, look at the seminal vesicles, look at the volume of the tumor in the gland. It's going to give us a really good idea of whether surgery is, is a reasonable thing or radiation or how we should deal with it. If it looks relatively well encapsulated, doesn't look like there's anything there, there's nothing suspicious, um, probably stop there. If there's any suspicious features, question of, of invasion, or there's a, a maybe a lymph node that they say on the MRI and say, eh, it's a little on the big side, we're not sure. That's a clear indication for doing the carbon acetate for us to get a better look um, at the seminal vesicles, look outside of the gland, look at that lymph node, and then assess the rest of the body. Um, I do have a number of, of urologists who, anyone with high risk features, they do send them for carbon acetate. Um, their plan is, Generally, they're going to do the surgery regardless, but they want to know how to do the surgery. They want to know, do they need to extend the surgery to do a more complete lymphadenectomy in the pelvis and get it all? And if we see something distant, that's going to change their mind. But if, as long as it's confined to the pelvis, they'll do a little bit more aggressive surgery, so they're still really trying to get it out and cure it. But they're not, they're, if we tell them there's something there, they're going to go after it. Um, and they wouldn't know that otherwise. So I think it's been very good to guide. How often in those cases? Did you find actually there's something accidental? Um, interestingly, I downstage people more than I upstage. So um, I find people who have been told surgery is not an option because of the way the gland looks. 
Gleason, I mean, we're talking Gleason 10, so 5 plus 5, and um, maybe even extra capsular extension that's obvious on um, an MRI. And carbon acetate shows there's no lymph nodes involved, there's nothing in the bone, there's nothing in the lungs. Um, and those patients have gone in to have surgery. And, um, and then also, usually also, they take the nodes out and confirm. And, and there's been some patients who've done very well with that, that who, they wouldn't have even been able to consider surgery, I think, um, previously. So, um, and then we, of course, we do find um, probably about a third of the time in, in really high places, I'm gonna find something distant. So I'm gonna be able to find a very early bone metastasis, a very early lung lesion, that, that's, that's gonna change the uh, treatment really quickly. Anybody else? We need your 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. All right, thank you very much. No other questions. I, I do have um, one other statement just to let you know. I brought um, a number of these with me. Um, I, did, I wrote an article for the PACS. This came out this December. Um, and mainly it goes through different patient scenarios. Um, it's something I think most of you share for those who are wondering, you know, is carbon acetate something to consider? goes through just different scenarios and you know, why we did it, what the results were, um, and what the, what the follow-up was. So that's, um, I got a package of these, and also just some of our brochures. So if people have questions, mainly it's, it's our card. So it has our phone number, and, um, and people should just call us. My clinical coordinator, myself, our team, we will field any question that if somebody calls and says this is the right test. And, and I, I'm, I'm going to um, always really try to be very appropriate of, doing the test if it's going to make a difference. I'm not really interested in doing negative tests. Um, and so sometimes that is hard to dissuade somebody who really wants a test, but um, we want to do these for where we're really going to get some information that's going to be helpful. For those of you that didn't know, that just came to the uh, presentation here, <coughs> Dr. Almeida did set in with our uh, advanced class over there for an hour, and he gave some very excellent feedback and information. Uh, I would, we don't pay them, but we save them time. But I have a matching set now. He, he has, well, I was just going to say that. Um, I'm going to have to offer to buy these back from you. <laughs> Thank you very much.